Hi guys. Well, we're getting somewhat of a sunrise on this cloudy <coughs> Monday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is time to get back to work here on Monday, January 27th, 2020. And this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. And I am getting back to work on Monday morning, I'm, I'm actually getting ready for an interview with uh, artist Nina Paley, which I'm very excited about. We're going to have a lot of fun talking to Nina, but before I call her, I should have time to uh, bring you today's Chronicle of the Collapse, um, sharing kind of a mashup of several writings from a fellow I had the pleasure of interviewing last week, and that is ecologist Charles A.S. Hall, Dr. Charles Hall. Uh, <clears throat> from University of New York and uh, he is credited, he is actually the guy who coined the term E-R-O-E-I Energy Return on Energy Invested and uh, so I had the pleasure of speaking to him for an hour a few days ago, and to kind of pique your curiosity about who this man is, we're just going to share <coughs> some selected passages from things he wrote. Okay, this is uh, Charles Hall talking about the, on the complete myth of transitioning to a renewable energy economy. <coughs> Undertaking this transition to renewables is likely to be far more demanding than anyone perceives, and the biophysical limits <coughs> are just the tip of the iceberg, for as more energy, read money, is needed for these new investments, it will be coming when energy resources are being squeezed in part due to declining EROI, and more energy will be demanded to maintain consumption. <clears throat> Almost everything labeled green has no chance, and it needs to be said. Hence, I think the limits to growth remains very real, but it is unrolling nation by nation, not everywhere at once, nor for the wealthier half of the Western nations. Well, not yet, anyway. Uh, renewables, uh, and now I've, I've talked about this with other folks. This is uh, Charles Hall pointing this out that renewables are being added to, not displacing fossil fuels, and oil use continues to increase. If we were able to stabilize fossil energy use, the CO2 in the atmosphere would still increase at the present rate. There is no possibility logically, for resolving these issues without stabilizing or reducing populations and economies, issues not even considered by most. If we do not do that through effective policy, nature will do it for us. But, what the hell, I do not do policy. I understood all of this when I was 22, and I did not have kids. So, what the hell, but I do not wish to inflict or see pain on any humans, and I think the pain would be less 
if we collectively understood all of this. <laughs> yes, do you think so, Charles? Okay, the co I wasn't the collapse of complex societies, I think was written by Joseph Tainter, I think is what he's uh, referring to here. The collapse of complex societies gave a general mechanism for collapse. The necessary development of energy requiring complexity as political systems and central cities expanded, increasing their need for imported food and other resources which had to come from further and further away. Eventually, these societies could not afford to maintain that complexity. All historians deal with the complexity of factors that generate, sustain, and cause the demise of cultures, and thus they are systems scientists with or without computer models. The growth and demise of cultures continues to be a fertile area for the application of concepts and tools generated within or parallel with systems ecology. I get in my email inbox various assessments of the probable collapse or occasionally the unlikelihood of collapse of modern societies or economies nearly daily. <clears throat> Then he talks about the, uh, the book, The Limits to Growth. The Limits to Growth <clears throat> generated extraordinary interest. This book, <coughs> I think, was written in 1972, if I remember correctly. This book, The Limits to Growth, predicted that if certain steps were not taken, that the global economy and civilization itself was, after a period of extended growth, likely to experience some very rough sledding due to the combined impacts of pollutants and resource depletion. <clears throat> the World 2 model from the limits to growth mapped important interrelationships among world population, industrial production, pollution, resources, and food. The model showed a collapse of the world's socio-economic system and human population sometime during the 21st century if steps were not taken to lessen the demands of the Earth's carrying capacity. And, of course, every year since 1972, uh, World Overshoot Day, Earth Overshoot Day, has gotten earlier and earlier and earlier. I was just reading an article a few days ago how we hit 100 billion tons of resource consumption last year uh, for the first time in human history. So, do your own math. Okay. <clears throat> the model was also used to identify policy changes capable of moving the global system to a fairly high quality state that is sustainable far into the future. <clears throat> Undertaking the seemingly logical thing, that is investing further in resource exploitation, which of course is exactly what we have been doing since 1972, caused greater chaos sooner. Hmm. Interestingly, the only way that the authors of the Limits to Growth could find to generate a stable future in which the population and other factors would not eventually move into violent oscillations was by limiting the growth of the human population 
and limiting all investments. <clears throat> if investments were not curtailed, then even if the human population were stabilized, the model predicted an eventual crash of civilization as spreading per capita affluence continued or even accelerated the processes of depletion and pollution generation. What did I just say about hitting 100 billion tons of uh, this planet-eating stuff for the first time in history last year? This is an extremely important issue not usually considered by those today devising, quote, sustainable futures. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we're going to finish up with this long uh, passage. I'm sorry, I don't have the name of this paper. I am sorry. Anyway, <clears throat> break this down for us, uh, Charles Hall. Many analysts believe EROI, meaning energy returned on, you know, the energy invested, is a critical tool for understanding the future of civilization. The frontier of biophysical economics today includes a wide range of other topics as well. For example, um, Hall, meaning Charles, and Ramirez Pasquale explore how vital fossil fuels, how vital fossil fuels are for the development of modern socioeconomic systems. Figure 1B, which you have to see the paper to look at. Figure 1B shows the simple biophysical economic model that begins to better reflect the embeddedness of the socioeconomic system in the biophysical world. Economic policies emanating from this model would have to reflect the realities of the biophysical world to address the root causes of societal problems and to ultimately avoid crossing the planetary boundaries of our global ecosystems. Understanding this fundamental relation between the laws of thermodynamics, energy inputs, and waste heat outputs and the socio-economic system is or should be a pillar of both biophysical economics and ecological economics as well as economics more generally. <clears throat> the first law states of, of thermodynamics states that the quantity of energy is conserved and the second that the quality of energy degrades with use. Since the prosperity and stability of modern society is inextricably linked to the production and consumption of fossil energy, <coughs> amounting <coughs> for over 80% of total energy consumed. The sustainable quantity and quality of any transition away from fossil fuels should be at the heart of any discussion of economic development. <coughs> It is obvious that the increase in GDP is closely related to the increase in energy use, implying that energy is required for the increase in wealth to occur. This is consistent with the thermodynamic concept that work, which economic the concept that work which economic production most certainly is, 
cannot occur without the expenditure of energy. Energy surplus is one of the most important biophysical factors because it accounts for the energy availability and quality that flows to the productive economy, i.e. that can allow humans to generate the goods and services they want as well as invest this extra energy into obtaining more energy to maintain and improve their complex systems. The maximum power principle states that during self-organization, system designs develop and prevail that maximize power intake energy transformation, and those uses that reinforce production and optimum efficiency. There have been doomsday predictions for society since at least Malthus in 1798 that generally have not come to pass at least for most Europeans and Americans, due to a variety of factors such as European immigration to the vastness of the Americas, displacement of Aboriginal people, the general industrialization of agriculture, green revolution, and contraception. However, the reduction in the global carrying <coughs> capacity of human population and reduction in consumption that was the focus of the predictions found in Paul Ehrlich's population bomb in 1968 and the limits to growth models in 1972 has not yet occurred generally. However, it is happening in many countries now, as persuasively explained by Nafiz Ahmed in 2017 in more recent work on defining a, quote, safe operating space for humanity. Credited to uh, Rockstrom. Uh, Ehrlich and Ehrlich have recently argued that although the worst case scenario of the population bomb has been avoided largely due to vast amounts of cheap fossil energy applied to our agricultural systems, many people in the developing world still face daily limits to growth and significant exploitation from the global north. To address population, biophysical economics includes demographic data and biophysical analyses. From a biophysical perspective, a sustainable population is one where there is a balance of renewable resources compared to the needs of the population of any given country or region of the world. Moreover, it is important to continue analyzing the impact that population, affluence, and technology, each allowed by cheap fossil energy, have on the environment to align our socio-economic systems with biophysical realities. This will be especially important for understanding the constraints and opportunities of the next energy transition. Money, finance, and especially debt are key drivers of unsustainability today due to a lack of understanding of their biophysical and social foundations. 
<clears throat> from a biophysical perspective, money is a lean on energy because each monetary transaction requires an energy investment. And he goes into this during, I, during our interview to explain this in terms that we can understand. For example, in the U.S. economy, it takes on average the energy of a half a coffee cup of oil to generate one dollar's worth of value of goods and services. The biophysical implications of this are that the wealthier the population is, the more energy it uses to generate goods and services, which also contributes to depletion, environmental impacts, and often social inequality. Nearly 100 years ago, Saudi warned us about the exponential growth of interest-bearing debt. Debt also, if it is to be honored, is a lean on future energy use. Debt in the U.S. has grown much larger today, a symptom of the misalignment between our socioeconomic system's focus on economic growth and the constraints of the biophysical world. In essence, we are borrowing energy and materials from the future without having any way to pay it back. Presumably, a debt can be honored only if energy is available to pay the bearer in real value or real goods and services which can be produced only if the energy is available and used to generate them. For example, to pay back the approximately $60 trillion of U.S. debt in real goods and services would require the equivalent of 60 billion barrels of oil or three years of all U.S. energy consumption. Since the U.S. debt is now around 360 percent of GDP today, it would take the energy required to produce 3.6 years of GDP to pay it back. Good luck. From a biophysical perspective, sustainability is about learning to sustain life on Earth by respecting the biophysical processes and thresholds of the planet and transforming our socioeconomic systems to better reflect the renewable rates and processes of global ecosystems. <clears throat> uh, for example, Table 2 provides a list of actions that can be used as a starting framework to develop biophysical plans for sustainability. Furthermore, to achieve biophysical sustainability, we need to be aware of Jevons' paradox where increasing energy efficiency tends to lead to increasing energy and resource use, often in new technologies. This will be especially important if, if and as we transition away from fossil fuels either by EROI constraints or policy choices. In the past century, the global economy has experienced unprecedented growth, largely due to the abundance of cheap fossil energy. 
However, the obsession with GDP growth since the 1950s has led to unsustainable policies that are overwhelming the natural capacity of the planet to absorb its waste outputs. Max Neef provided empirical evidence about the threshold hypothesis to explain that there is a limit where economic growth does not increase the quality of life and in fact it can decrease it. In the face of uneconomic growth, some are calling for economic degrowth by rethinking our consumption patterns and the need to downscale our economies. We believe that stabilizing and in time reducing economic and population growth and levels is fundamental for biophysical sustainability and it will continue to be essential to think critically about these issues and come up with a socio-economic system that can respect the biophysical thresholds of the planet and address inequalities. If, however, economic growth continues to be barely above population growth and then there are increasing biophysical restrictions on the economy. Good Lord guys, I am sorry I did not realize what I was diving into and uh, I am afraid that my battery is getting ready to collapse. I thought this was going to be a 15 minute uh, reading. I probably am up to 30 minutes. I need to uh, find some cheap fossil energy real quick. Uh, let's get some fossil energy flowing. Uh, all right, do we have fossil energy flowing to finish this uh, chronicle of the collapse? Good Lord, where were we? Uh, I anyway, guys, uh, at some point, I, I, I just, I did not have any idea uh, how long this was. I did not, uh, obviously, I did not uh, I, I misunderstood. But anyway, I think we get the idea because uh, this would go on for another 15 or 20 minutes. Let's jump down to the very, very bottom of this. And I'm sorry, I, I will try to find the link, but I don't think I can post the link to this. Uh, okay, <clears throat> getting down to the closing of this uh, chronicle of the collapse from Charles Hall. The limit, uh, okay, if we stick to conventional economics and leave this to the market, people will seek immediate gain and because of high discount rates, this will encourage consumption now versus investment for a better or less bad future. The limited energy available for consumption will be exacerbated as future energy supplies are increasingly diverted to pay for mounting debt continued population growth and current consumption patterns will exacerbate these problems. This has deep consequences to our biophysical sustainability with long-term social and economic implications. 
and uh, anyway guys uh, I have got to wrap up uh, this chronicle of the collapse from Charles Hall and uh, switch gears to my interview with cartoonist and animator Nina Paley uh, I go down all rabbit holes here on Collapse Chronicles so if you enjoyed today's chronicle of the collapse uh, please take a few minutes, a few seconds to thumb it up. If you did not like what Charles had to tell you, take a few seconds to thumb it down. And please subscribe while you're over here. And do keep an eye out for this uh, conversation with Charles Hall, which I will be publishing probably in about four weeks, more or less. Bye, guys.